Okay, we'll get started. Um, as people join the room, we will let them uh, periodically join. Wyatt, if you can kind of keep an eye on that and uh, continue to add people in. Recognize a lot of the names on there, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jeremy Foyet. I am one of the co-founders of Milwaukee and the chief idea officer. Yes, I made up that title on my very own. Um, don't do much, but come up with ideas. <laughs> I'll set the company. Uh, but uh, today we're gonna talk about onboarding and integration. Um, and some things I'm gonna talk about, cause it will be a little bit different than maybe you were expecting. Um, was I'm going to get, get pretty tactical, uh, but I'm also going to talk a lot about the science of people and really dive deep into how do we look at science and psychology to make better decisions on how we foster connection between our people. And then I'm going to give a lot of examples of things that we've done, things that we've created, uh, things that you can steal and take and use on your very own. Uh, things that you can adapt that we have done that you could use on your very own. And then, you know, answer any questions. I'll keep, I'll try to um, stop periodically throughout the presentation so you can uh, definitely ask questions or also use the chat. And, you know, there's a lot of people on the call in similar industries. So if you do want to post your LinkedIn link on the, in the chat too, you know, we can connect online and offline. So, uh, but you know, just so for those of you who don't know, Milwaukee is an engagement agency. We work with companies around engaging people. Uh, that could be customers, that could be employees, that could even be candidates. But today we're here to talk about onboarding integration and some of the things we've done. And I want to come at this from a different, um, different take. I'm not going to talk about like specifics on what kind of training you need to be onboarded and, and some of those really specific processes that are um, you know, so products of someone's own company, but I want to talk more in general terms around people. So we experience kind of great products all the time, you know, from some of the products you see there. And, you know, a majority of the time, these, these products are stellar, they're seamless, they're engaging. And it, however, when it comes to onboarding and integration of new talent, it's often disjointed, disconnected, and you know, can even be isolating. And I'm gonna just launch a quick poll for everyone. And I just want you to kind of answer this question is, you know, what percentage of people are unhappy with their onboarding experience? And I'll give a second to have everybody take this polling and then I'll, I'll share the results. Give it a few more seconds. Almost got everybody to take it. If you ran and got a coffee, I will leave it up. Okay, I'm gonna end that poll. And so the majority of um, people came back. Let me share these results with everybody. And the majority of people came back in, you know, around 50 and 70%. Well, you know, that's interesting, right? Like that's a pretty high number. And, and if you think about, well, here's the actual number. 88% um, of employees think they're on, their employer did a poor job of the onboarding process. And I know that each of you probably on this, this call have been in a meeting where someone said, don't reinvent the wheel. Let's do things the same. And to me, I, every time I hear that, I cringe. Because if I have these kind of statistics, you know, 88 per, oops, 88 percent of people that say they did they had a poor experience onboarding, I am going to go and reinvent the wheel. I'm going to make a lot of different different improvements. So if we could kind of put be in the mindset of reinventing the wheel this presentation and thinking about something differently, I think we'll come out on the other side better. And um, so, you know, not only does onboarding improve retention rates by about 82%, but it also improves productivity. And it kind of would be like, you know, not improving this, but kind of be like using the same iPhone from 10 years ago, right? Even if we have a good onboarding experience and a good integration plan on paper, it needs to be constantly tweaked. 
it needs to be constantly thought about differently and changed um, consistently for consistent for continuous improvement. Because if, if, if HR people and talent acquisition people thought like product managers, um, the same way people design products, you, you'd think about the onboarding as a product and how you could design it the best. You know, thinking about your brand, employer brand as a product. But there's a, there's a dilemma here, right? In most products, we want someone to use the product and we work with that user to make the best possible experience. But in the HR product, you know, an HR product manager dilemma would be the company wants to know how can I get the most out of this person? On the flip side, talent wants to know how can I get the most out of a company, which creates a lot of friction. And, and we have to come up with ways to remove that friction. And a couple of those, oops, sorry, I'm freezing up here. Whoa. You know, so what people say they want when they first start a job is hands-on job training. I'm not gonna to dive into that. Everybody has different training protocols. Um, you can decide on your own what training is needed. Uh, but you know, they want a review of company policies. They want a tour of the company. They want their equipment. They want, but really what, what a lot of people want is mentors and peer connections and to, to spend time with their superiors, which is some of the stuff that we kind of overlook but you know how we, a lot of product manager or a lot of HR product managers start designing stuff like this: fun activities, Zoom happy hours, um, you know, free food, scavenger hunts, all these activities that maybe don't get at the core of human connection. So there's what people want, what we create is stuff like this, and then you know what people really need is psychological safety, dependability, structure and clarity, a purpose, and they wanna know that they make an impact. And you know, if for those of you that have seen some of my presentations before, I talk a lot about psychological safety in the workplace. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the term or haven't worked or, or um, haven't seen any of the reports on this, um, you know, Google did a massive study of thousands of, of um, managers and employees and found the best performing teams, the teams with psychological safety. And what that really means is, you know, teammates feel they can come to work as themselves and um, they're able to take risks without being punished for, for something or they can admit a mistake or ask a question or offer a new idea without the fear of being reprimanded for that. Um, and it takes a lot of focus on building connection to do that. So, you know, our goals of onboarding should be how do we instill our values? Uh, how do we connect people to people? Because, um, you know, when you think about companies, a majority of the people in our companies are going to interact with people all the time. And this is the one we're going to focus on today. And then obviously information, which is you know, some of the things that um, you can you provide them. But you know, when employees start the company, their enthusiasm is extremely high, right? And that wanes wanes over, uh, you know, months of that first year of onboarding integration. But what goes up is knowledge and connections within the company. So how do we kind of switch the enthusiasm line and, and move that up and continue to have it grow with the knowledge and connections in the company? You know, and you know, onboarding if done right. Right. If 88% if of people are saying that you know, they had a poor experience, what that tells me is if I was an, a product manager working in HR or changing my mindset of being a product manager, I would think this would be a huge competitive advantage to come up with a better onboarding in, integration plan to retain talent. And what that looks like is you start to build what I call intellectual infrastructure. And you know, if you've seen my presentations before, I talk a lot about how we've designed workplaces um, around the physical infrastructure, over-designed them, you know, extremely over-designed the physical need for certain things, the amount of space that people need. And what we really should be designing in the future if we're gonna design better workplaces, what are the intellectual infrastructure things that we can design to bring people together when people are working just remote, when they're hybrid, uh, when they're in the office. So I'm gonna kind of go into about three steps uh, around that. And my first step 
uh, when we help companies or when we do stuff internally at Milwaukee is around fostering deep human connection. And we've become absolutely obsessed with this. You know, if you look at any of the social sciences, it'll tell you that human beings are like just social creatures, right? We, we need to interact, we need to survive, we need to thrive, but the need to, to connect is universal, right? We're naturally driven towards establishing belonging. And relationships between employees and, and management are like, you know, the substantial value, that's a substantial value in the workplace. And human relations is the process of training employees, addressing their needs, fostering workplace culture and resolving conflict between different employees. And um, so when we wanna foster human connection, uh, you know, we have to kind of get into what that means and the really the truth about job satisfaction and, and friendship. And friendship can be this, you know, sit, this, I would say, hippy dippy thing. But when you start to dive into friendship, not that everybody has to be soulmate friends or kindred friends, but, you know, there is a lot of research around what happens when someone is a friend in the workplace. And, you know, the, there, there's a lot of research around the key to thriving in the workplace just isn't ambition or smarts or like playing office politics. But according to a lot of research, you know, support and involvement with friends in the workplace will skyrocket employee satisfaction about 50%. Um, people who say they don't have a best at friend at work are 56% more likely to be disengaged. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting data when you start digging into the psychology of the workplace that makes me think, how do we foster more friendships? How do we foster more relationships? You know, just in general, people's friendships are down in, in uh, you know, pre-COVID or what I would say BC, <laughs> before COVID. Uh, you know, people had a people uh, admitted in the last 20 years, they only have two close friends where you know, 20 years before that they had three close friends. You know, 61% of Americans say they're socially isolated. You know, that number's skyrocketed in the 70% during COVID. So thinking about friendships is important. And, uh, you know, according to this, you know, a new study by Global Work Connectivity, over half of employees feel lonely at work which tells me we're doing a bad job of product design and fostering connections, right? It tells me we can do a better job to improve this. It, it tells me that isolation is really important to belonging. Um, you know, and a, and a study found that 70% of employees say friends at work is the most crucial element to a happy work life. And 58% of people will, will refuse a higher paying job if it meant not getting along with coworkers. This is pretty, which makes sense, right? Yeah, we've just come completely obsessed with this. And so how, how we actually foster a lot of human connection in the workplace is with a bunch of, you know, think of day one when someone starts, there's a lot of superficial introductions. There may be in a couple of events um, that, you know, rely on serendipity to meet somebody new and rely on someone to be maybe a, a large extrovert to go connect to somebody or feel comfortable doing that. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of buddy systems that are created, um, but we don't do anything around the science of those buddy systems of why we would match a person with a certain other person. Um, usually it's who's the most extroverted, the most um, jovial, the person that's really outgoing. Let's, they seem to be the, the, the person we want to match with somebody else. And no, you know, no other thought into the science of why someone would connect. Um, so, what we're recommending, and I'll show you how we do this, is we're recommending the, the opposite of that. You know, less big events, more one-to-one, -one, more small groups, more study around the psychology and the neuroscience of why people connect. And I'll go into some of that uh, and why we build trust in, in a second. But really focusing not on serendipitous moments, because those will happen, but focusing like how can we as an employer create more deliberate serendipity? Um, how, how do we help foster those connections? And how do we, you know, you're gonna see probably in the next five to 10 years, the rise of a community manager inside of companies. Uh, you're seeing a lot of that right now on some of the uh, companies on the coast uh, and building community in, looking at their company as a community. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with focusing on, on these deeper connections. So some of the, you know, one of the things that we've done for a few people uh, inside companies 
right now is we've created some uh, uh, a year long onboarding uh, belonging program. And I'll show you kind of the science behind it, uh, but uh, this is a little bit of the structure of it. So on day one, or actually even before they start, they are matched with someone in the company that's a kindred spirit, you know, a, couple, a group of three to five people. Does it mean they're alike 100%, right? Just because they're a match doesn't mean they're like each other. It means that they would be a good compatibility. They have a structured internal meeting of meeting 30 to 45 days. That's around uh, personal and professional goals in the workplace. Uh, there, you know, it's around vulnerability. It's around getting connected to each other. It's around having a safe space for people. But it really is connecting people across silos in the company too. So it's not just people on their team. And that lasts for about six months. And then after that six months, um, we actually switch it and put them with a growth partner. So someone that's the opposite of them. And we do that same process over and over. And that process allows us to have a, you know, a, a core group of people at the start of the company that are, I would say, like-minded. And then a group of people at the company that are opposite, maybe even a mentor that would be um, of a you know, different mindset. And how do we kind of come to this? Well, we come to this with a lot of science, right? Um, and we started building and becoming obsessed with how personality, life stage, life experience, and future aspirations of people could develop friendship. And so we built an algorithm around that. And I'll give you an example of kind of what people go through and how this works. So, you know, if you, if someone, when someone moves to a new city and they start at a new company, it's kind of different if someone lives in the city, it's a huge life stage transition. Um, it's, it's, it's a massively, can be massively isolating. And I think we don't think too much about, you know, we move people in the city, we find them a house that we don't, you know, it's, it, we don't go deep into much more than that besides that they, they might not know anybody in the city and to struggle to find connection, especially when you're not in a college setting anymore is difficult. So what we've been doing is um, having people take a short assessment. And so we can get uh, some information to match them. And we've been matching them right at the beginning uh, when they start at a company, whoops, um, with like-minded people. So Jennifer, who just moved to Milwaukee from Chicago would have three kindred, kindred being the best possible matches uh, with inside a company. So instantly you could see here that Jennifer and Priya match and their feathers, you know, birds of a feather flock together, uh, would be some of their high intensity of interests. And so we know that there's gonna be an icebreaker there without playing silly icebreaker games. Um, we know that they can connect because of their personality and their life stage and their life experience. We know that they'll be instantly um, a hit because we've done this uh, a lot and we beta tested this a lot and found, you know, have a 99% connection rate um, where people say they're extremely likely to meet again and love their connection. It's like they were friends their whole lives. Uh, and so, and what we found is that when people don't connect um, in 90 days, uh, the, the, the relationship deteriorates. And the reason I'm spending so much on this is because these, these relationships are important to a person that starts, but they're also important to the longevity of a person at the company. And, you know, we could even go into the strength of their connection. You know, how strong, how many times have they met? How strong is that connection? Does it fade each day um, if they don't communicate? And what it would look like or what it has looked like for some of our clients is it's looked like this uh, matching tool for kindred partners for, and then you can also on, on here, you can see that there's uh, growth partners, which would be the opposite. So if you're doing mentor programs in the company, which um, would be, you know, from day one, you, you're definitely gonna wanna put a mentor in this. So you could do a kindred match and a mentor. And then you could also create better activities than, uh, you know, let's all go to the escape room because that's a cool thing to do and realizing that everybody is, is, is really thrown off by that or awkward, you know, it, it can, creates an awkward environment. We can kind of see more interest intensities and then we can match people in cohorts. 
and we kind of make these connections. <clears throat> and so uh, what you, you, you come to find out is that you know, maybe people are not as extroverted and that's why they're not going to the programs that you have after work. Or maybe they're in a specific life stage that doesn't allow them to do that. Um, and maybe you're cre creating the programs at our company that actually don't connect with the employees there because we send out a survey and get results that actually aren't uh, representative of what people want to do or want to connect with. And so, yeah, we've been kind of really obsessed with this lately and piloting and testing this out, but it's, be it's becoming, uh, you know, you have people that say the, the craziest stuff, you know, the, like, the, you know, people that have moved from different cities They've met fascinating people through this at their employers, and it, you're turning your 30 minutes into 90 minute conversations because you're finding this deep connection of, of relationships. And you, you kind of see when people go through this belonging program, their self assessment is you know complete growth in critical thinking, communication, collaboration, belonging. And um, you know, it's a, when you when you focus on those relationships, you get more results. Um, and I'll answer some of these questions. So, any questions? You want to come off mute? Uh, ask a question. Okay, I have a couple in the chat here. Um, I'm going to try to catch up. Sorry, I just want to pause because I. Uh, Key asked, "What if your organization is small and you only have five people in your boss from the five? Yeah, that'd probably be too small of a group uh, to match. You know, usually you want, I mean, you could definitely find matches in there, but if you have five people, you should be uh, pretty connected already. Um, you think about like a startup, right? That has about three to five people and how they can topple a company that has 5,000 people working on that same problem. It's because that startup has extreme psychological safety, extreme trust and mo passion and motivation. So five people should be on the same page where you wouldn't need something like, you shouldn't need something like this. Um, you could, but uh, I, I, you know, I would say that there's other ways to work on it. Uh, where can we find the app and survey? Yeah, this is something we do, uh, it's not online, it's something that we do with uh, clients. Yeah, and then um, why it's been going to some, okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep going here. If you have any other questions, definitely ask. Uh, but the second thing is around building trust. And what I wanna share here is, you know, a lot of building trust I've seen or, and worked with a lot of clients is around um, icebreaker games and, and, and trying to do forced fun, uh, forced happy hours and forced things that people may or may not want to go to. Uh, depending on their personality type or their life situation or their stage. And maybe there's a better way to think about it. And if, there, if you've ever dove deep into the neuroscience behind how to build trust, uh, you'll, you can un, start to unravel and program things differently on an onboarding integration uh, pack, on an onboarding integration uh, one year program. Um, so there's a chemical uh, called oxytocin which is you know, everybody's maybe may or may not be familiar with this, but uh, you're probably familiar with dopamine, right? Same, different chemical. Um, so when you study dopamine, obviously, you know, Facebook like, uh, if someone plays Candy Crush, you know, the, that reward circuitry you get from playing games like that and the like, it uh, sends a spikes in your dopamine. Well, there's another chemical um, based on all the, neuroscience studies of this called oxytocin, which is kind of the love hormone. If some of you on the call have kids, you know, it's the, the bonding chemical between a mother and a baby. Uh, but it also is a way to build trust and you can measure that. And I'll, and I'll kind of show you. So uh, the first way to build, uh, to have spikes in oxytocin in people is to be recognized. Uh, and we all know this, right? We all know we love to be recognized but yet we, we don't build intellectual, enough intellectual infrastructure around it. But when, you know, when somebody gets recognized, especially when it's not planned, like maybe in a stand-up meeting, uh, there's oxytocin increases in the blood around 67% um, an increase. So, and that means that's a tr opening of trust when you get recognized. And some of the things that we have built around trust um, 
is you know more one-to-one -one meetings, uh, more asynchronous problem solving. And this is, and what I mean by that is, a lot of times in meetings when we tr when we want to recognize somebody or we want to um, ask for someone's opinion to for the, the for them to be recognized, we put them right on the spot, right? We have a brainstorming session. We have a Monday morning meeting, and we're asking everybody to say, you know, respond to this challenge in the instantaneous moment that I gave you that that statement. And what that creates is a whole lot of problems, right? It creates reactive thinking, um, it, and not everybody can think like that. It puts people that are introverted actually on the back burner. Um, it puts people that don't have trust within the organization to not want to speak up. And so an asynchronous problem solving solution would be if I am starting on day one and I want to build trust with my employees and I want to recognize them is to say, hey, here's a big challenge you have coming up. We're going to have a meeting around this next week. Um, here's what you want to have prepared for it. That way, everybody can look at it. And even the people that don't plan um, can be still be spontaneous. But the people that do want to plan and have more deep thought uh, can have that time to do that. Or, you know, another approach is like a flashcard approach. If you do have to do it right in the moment is asking or prompting a question uh, that would allow people to write stuff down as opposed to uh, speak out loud. And then everybody share their responses that they broke down, which creates a lot of silence on maybe a Zoom call, but creates a lot of uh, solutions to people that don't speak up in meetings. And, and what's interesting about that is then when you have an idea and you acknowledge somebody for that idea and give them recognition, it will create more trust. Um, you know, there's something we also do at Milwaukee that you could rip this off and steal. Uh, it's been very, very helpful um, and super interesting is we call them whole days. Um, and this was based off a study that Google did um, where they synced everybody, they, they looked at people's calendars uh, for engineers, software engineers, and realized that uh, there was not enough flow time for innovation because people were in consistent meetings uh, about things that weren't their day-to-day -day work. So we, you know, after reading that report at Milwaukee, we created whole days. So it just means a whole day of no meetings uh, and a whole day a block in your calendar, like the wordplay there, right? And it's a space for flow and innovation to work on things at the company or work on ideas uh, that you're passionate about that might solve a problem. And when you're onboarding people, this gives them a chance to shine and think deeper. And it gives them time to really think about it and research it during that whole day. And it also gives space uh, to not have stuff on the calendar, which is a bunch of meetings that you're, you're ping ponging back and forth with, where it gives you more time to collect your thoughts. Um, I'm gonna take a quick question here. Okay, there's some statements. Um, one of the questions is any advice on getting buy-in for this level of onboarding and membership? You know, I definitely could, you know, I would look at, I mean, if you've ever, first of all, the, the buy-in comes from data, right? Like if you have data around like, you know, 31% of people leave their jobs within the first three months, right? So if you have data of people, of retention rates, of people leaving early, people leaving under a year, you could look at it and say, you know, 30% of the people leave in this time, this is something, this might be a problem, or even your exit interviews and things where people are giving you advice uh, on their onboarding, or, you know, it's, it's a lot, like, if you have more one-to-ones, people are definitely going to be more honest in smaller groups than they are in big groups. And you could definitely um, get some more one-to-one -one anecdotal information and then build the case with some data and, and some feedback if that, that helps. Otherwise, I'm free to uh, talk afterwards too and we can kind of maybe build a plan together. Uh, so, you know, the, the next thing, you know, and you know, just to go really quickly, sorry, I've missed one point here. To go back to, uh, Go back to recognizing people. So there's different levels of spike in the trust chemical of oxytocin. And I know this is very technical, but it's it's really 
important. It's one thing to get uh, acknowledgement when it's one to one, uh, but it extremely spikes when it's in group settings and it's uh, it's in, in a public eye. So like if anybody's ever got a round of applause, the spike in oxytocin is so high when that, because that feeling creates trust and connection to uh, who's ever awarding you it. So it's like when you give award shows and when you get things like that. So any of that re research around this is, is extremely important. And then you can then you can build stuff out of the next thing, um, which we, you know, after doing, you know, researching a couple of these uh, report, oh, sorry, around this neuroscience around this is, you know, being more intentional around building this stuff. It's no one's job to really do this, right? You know, there isn't an onboarding integration person that works with every employee. It's more of a, a year of, hey, go do this stuff. It's more of a schedule, right? And what we really need is to think more about how do we build this in, in our day-to-day -day workspace. Um, and people want to be, you know, people that are more intentional about connecting to people in the workplace, see the results. And um, I think one of the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mute someone out here one second. Um, so one of the things that we tend to do again is, 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 is intentionally force fund people, right? What people really want is that, you know, and what happens when we force fund people is that they actually becomes a distraction from what people really want and that's meaningful connection. And if you've ever done any research on events in the workplace and forced fun, uh, you'll realize that people can't stand it. And, and we keep doing that, especially when we have interns in. And what people don't like about it is that it's forcing you to do things that aren't of interest or aren't um, a way, and, it, and people actually don't connect. They just go hang out with who they want to, which is fine. But I think the people can do that on their own. And here's, here's kind of how we do it at Milwaukee. So we actually sponsor things they wanna do on their own, right? We're focused on connecting, connecting each other. And if people wanna do something like join an organization or you know, connect with another employee or have like a pizza party, whatever, if they wanna do that stuff, we have a budget to go sponsor that stuff. It's not saying everybody in the company must come to a pizza outing or everybody in the company must go uh, to a escape room together uh, at a time that might not, may or may not be in, or convenient for you after work. And especially in these new work environments, it's gonna be even harder to do things like that. Um, we also find that like theme, uh, uh, deeper questions and more meaningful questions when we do connect people uh, releases other levels of oxytocin. So we do a lot of theme-based rapid fire networking, optional. If people want to network and they really crave that connection, it's there for them not forced, not mandated, um, but it's theme based around building your future career here. Um, where do you need help? Where are you gonna create a revival in the company? How do you connect deeper inside the company? What are things you need? And we do these theme based rapid fire networking things on Zoom to really get beyond superficialness of talking about the weather or potholes in the road and things like that. And, you know, even, you know, things that you can recommend are more <laughs> anxiety parties is kind of a weird one, but it, it's, it's having these small trusted groups that we talked about in the beginning that get more vulnerable and, and, and actually create these, these small groups that provide people with what are their challenges in the workplace? What are they struggling with? And when you have psychological safety in the workplace, you know that being vulnerable is important and accepted as opposed to looked at as negative. Um, and then, you know, giving before you get is one that we probably all know, and I'll just show you some statistics on this one. Um, so, you know, Harvard Business School did a study in which salespeople received two types of monetary incentives. You know, they got incentives for themselves and they got incentives for the team. And what they saw was um, 
anytime someone gives something to someone else on their team, they had spikes in oxytocin. So spikes in trust. And people that had individual sales goals increased their sales by $4.5. But in contrast, people that had team goals and, and gave something to the rest of their teammates, their sales went up an average of $78. So a 500% return on things that are focused on a team as opposed to an individual, even though we definitely, you know, always look at there's a sales person, right? There's, you know, but if you think about it a little bit differently, there's other ways to uh, release this oxytocin through, through trust. So um, and then the next thing is follow-up. Uh, when people follow up with people, it releases a lot of trust. And so there's ways you can do this, but there's a study in this book called The Trust Factor, and they studied 5,301 individuals from across many different countries. And they found when people followed up with people, it released trust and it, re it released the chemical and it, it, it spike in oxytocin, but it also improved trust in the team. So the question, if I was a trying to create, a, if I was a project manager in HR, and I keep coming back to this product manager thing, because I think it's important to think like that. Um, I would start designing things that help people follow up better. Um, and that goes back to one-on-ones. Um, we do something at Milwaukee, which is like a, a discovery type sessions or crush sessions where everybody gets together and kind of jams out on a, on a specific challenge so we can expedite trust and expedite decision-making. Uh, and then we do something, and if you've seen some of my presentations before, I talk about this one a lot because it's definitely one thing that's uh, helped with a lot of trust and a lot of uh, um, help knowing what's happening in the company. But at the end of everybody, at the end of every day, everyone writes an email to someone on the, to everyone on their team, copies all, it's, and that's the facts of the day that what they did. It doesn't, it's not long. It takes like one to three minutes and you're writing down what you accomplished, what a meeting you had, what you worked on. Um, not that we want to micromanage you, but we also, what we really want to get at is what, what do you need help on? How do you keep me up to date on what's happening so I don't have to ask the question, you know, what are we doing here? Oh, I didn't know we were doing this. So every employee has a sight line, but when everybody sends that every day, it releases all this trust that people are accomplishing something. And it's a little tactic you can steal and start going out and doing this in your workplace that when you're onboarding somebody and integrating them, they get an instant treasure trove of information and details about the company. And it could be a great way uh, to incorporate to every onboarding integration plan. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, I, I kind of keep making light of escape rooms and I have nothing, I, I have nothing against going to escape rooms with friends and stuff, but um, you know, shared experience plus time is the ultimate connection and why people end up being friends in the workplace because it takes the time to build connections, right? But what, what you find is that there's high levels of relationship trust that are, that are unleashed when people spend a lot more time together. Um, so it's harder when we're remote and we miss some of that. So we really have to think of ways to, to help improve that. And um, just, just so everyone knows, it, it takes on average of 60 to 90 hours to turn an acquaintance into a meaningful relationship. That's a long time, right? That's a lot of hours. So how do you expedite that? And that's what the beginning of this, we talked about kindred partners and matching people up uh, through science. And what you get from that is a way to, structure that and build some intellectual infrastructure around structuring a whole year of integration. And you get that 60 to 90 hours pretty fast. Because what happens when you build friendships is you do stuff outside of work. Um, you build, you do stuff with your team and your, your, your group organically. You don't need your company to actually do that kind of programming. And, you know, shared experiences have changed so much. You know, this is a shared experience of an event we create called the night market. And now this is a shared experience, you know, a lot different than what we're used to. So we have to get a lot more, uh, a lot more, there's a lot more thought work and a lot more improvement when it comes to onboarding people because this will, there's a lot of people here having a shared experience with their friends 
where this is, you know, you know, sometimes forced can be awkward. You know, one people, oops, one person can talk at a time. People interrupt each other. You know, it's really hard to kind of make this cohesive um, unless you're really thinking through a breakout room experience. And then, kind of finally, here uh, on this, oops, is you know, what are your rituals at your company? Oxytocin is released. That trust chemical is re released when people are looking forward to something. The same amount of release that happens when people actually have memories of things they like. And so if we're looking forward to important things that are a company, what are those things that are, are rituals, are traditions in the company that are part or built into the cult culture? Is it a boring company picnic? Or is it a you know bad Panera lunch? Or, or is it something that's like, you know, one of the things we do every year is take the team to a different city on a company trip um, for exploration. And um, we also have monthly inspiration breaks where a different person talks about their passion to the rest of the team. I talked about the whole day experience. Um, so, you know, all these things are rituals that people look forward to, or people can create. It gives them autonomy and gives them connection to other people in the company. But if I would start, the ritual is a form of an intellectual infrastructure, right? Like what are the things that people are gonna look forward to doing and how do you build those things in your company? Okay, and then the last, my last kind of thing here is about thinking in moments. And this is gonna be some of the more fun stuff, right? You know, so employees that have the high sense of belonging have 75, fewer sick days and employees who feel excluded. You know, employees that um, feel included have or excluded have a 50% higher turnover rate. Uh, employees that, you know, that, that cost the company is about $10 million. So if we start thinking of every moment, if we're product managers now in the HR world and we think of onboarding integration as a product, we can start to analyze the moments that people become disconnected. And I think you know, one of those moments is challenging what we've always been told because we've always been told to treat others like you'd like to be treated. But really what we should focus on is treating others like they like to be treated. And one of the things we do in Milwaukee is have people set up their own personal user manual. And this helps, this is, so this is a man or Jessica's, um, she would put down her stuff, her information, right? She writes down what are some things, unfiltered things about you. She designs how she works, how her work environment, uh, what are the things that drives her, areas where th she thinks she can grow, what are some things that maybe people misunderstand about you that need clarification. And this user manual, because we have manuals in every product we've ever used except people. And it's tough, right, to understand and learn people. So this is a thing that we do when someone starts is to help them create their personal user manual. And it helps us then um, design things and work around the individual. And you know, the other thing is understanding people's life stage. Uh, we talked a little bit about being new to the city and how overwhelming that can be and how isolating that experience can be. You know, there's other things like people that graduated college, people that have families. These are all life stages that are extremely different and they're not one size fits all. So they need different types of, of um, care on onboarding strategy. But you know, most of it is show up for work on ready to day one. Uh, before day one, how do we care about your entire household? And that's how we, we look at it. And that's how we've helped some companies. And I'll show you an example on before day one, how do we show we care about your entire household? And one of the things, or a couple, we've done this for a bunch of companies, we've designed pre and post integration plans uh, for new employees. So when they're coming on the interview, if they're not from the city, uh, we give them a tour of the city for their entire household, whoever comes on that, that interview, based on a data profile and based on information that would uh, help them find belonging in the city. So you know, I, I live in Milwaukee, for those of you who are not in Milwaukee, um, We've designed them in other cities. And the cool thing about this is it's if they have a significant other, the tour is a match type program. So if I live in a warehouse district or I live in the suburbs or I live in this, we try to match what they have and what they want 
and what they're looking for and what their intensity of interests are with where it is in the city. And we try to explore the whole city um, in this short time, but it really is giving them an idea of how they could see themselves living there. And then once they start, once they start, we build a 180 day community integration plan. So beyond the company, right? The company builds its own type of integration plan, but we actually help them connect to community for 180 days. And that could be connecting to, you know, where do I want to um, volunteer at? You know, how do I connect to extracurricular programming? Maybe I want to get involved in the tech scene. Um, how do I meet those people? And again, it's not about an event. It's about fostering these connections that really matter to people. And we've had people, you know, story after story about people that have went through this. And, you know, people that have moved from other cities that say, you know, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me because it wasn't, it's like they cared about me as a person. It's not about, I was just starting day one and I had to show up and here's my laptop. Here's Jen from accounting. Here's Bob from marketing. Uh, you know, here's their desk. It was more about, I'm looking at you as a whole person. I'm looking at your needs and I wanna make sure that it's not just about the workplace, but it's about connecting the community so you can belong here. And um, it has been a pretty sick, you know, so we actually build these and let the companies run them themselves, but it's been a really interesting uh, finding on ways to build better onboarding strategies and integration. Uh, and then, you know, challenging what we've always been told is, you know, we do a lot of work with intern programs. And I, every time I see an intern package of this, like, you know, there's four months and we jam everything in with a bunch of random over-programmed activities. Uh, but really, you know, when we do like exit interviews and exit talks with interns and anecdotal information, uh, what we find is they don't, they don't really need any of that stuff. That's not what they want, right? But we build all these quote unquote fun programs for people. And, you know, some, they, they, if they're, sometimes they can be useful, but most of the time people don't wanna to go to them. And they really want more meaningful connections. They want to feel like they contribute to the company and they want to get to know the culture of their city. So, when we, you know, and I learned a lot of this when we do Milwaukee 101 or you do kind of selling the city type of uh, sessions. I find out a lot of information on what people really want. And it's, it's a lot more city focused and it's a lot more of how do I connect to people as friends, not about like a whole event with 100 people at it. Um, so you know, what we'd recommend if you're boarding on, for those of you who are working in the intern world, is matching people with kindred pods right off the bat, making sure that they have people that they can go to, a, you know, if they're starting in the city, they can go do their own events. If they want to go to a music festival or they want to go to dinner or they want to go to, you know, they're going to have their own interests. You do that stuff with friends. Uh, how do we match people so they can make their own decisions? Um, the relationships matter, not the program. Um, we want, we would recommend matching them with a mentor in the company. I'm sure a lot of you do that already. That's pretty common. You can create, you know, I'd say a maximum of three marquee programs over the summer. If you're creating an internship, a kickoff event, something in the middle and a closing event. Um, make sure they're, and I'll show you a couple of unique things in a second. Uh, but make sure you're, you're designing a lot of time for one-to-one -one with their superiors. So they get that connection to the community and you know optional tours of the city. Now, some people might be from the city, some people might not be um, in a lot of these intern programs they work with, but people really wanna get, and they don't wanna see this the tourist stuff. They wanna get to know the culture of the city. So make sure it's not just focused on seeing the museum that none of the locals really maybe even attend. You know, so let's focus on what the culture and the impact of the city can be. Um, so, you know, we've, you know, seen a lot of different awkward intern events over the time um, from scavenger hunts to, you know, we're all going to get the, we're all going to sit in line at a baseball game where no one talks to each other. We're going to have these seats and it's really uh, awkward. Uh, but what could it be better than that? You know, cultural programs like festivals at a party, you know, this could be a thing where you go to something that's already happening and you have a, a special section that shows off the culture of the city. Um, you know, we do stuff for employers around bonfires on the beach. 
um, things that they would invite friends to. You know, every time you create a program, I'm thinking, would they invite their friends to this? And if they wouldn't, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. And you know, some of the we, we've created retreats for employers out in the woods. But you know, so you can get really crazy with these. But sometimes, again, it can be overdone and overforced. So, you know, think differently about the experience. Make the experiences more interesting um, and make them less awkward. But don't over-program them is my advice. And then the, my last thing here before we stop and I ask um, or any more questions. Um, to me, onboarding is, you know, we think about it as a set time. It's 30 days, 90 days. Uh, really, for me, it's indefinite, right? It, it never stops. After the first year of matching people, you match more people. Um, relationships always grow. Relate, people leave companies. You can always introduce people to new people. People always are looking to grow in their company. And having a set time, maybe you have a set program for a year, but it should be about how do we consistently integrate people in the company? Uh, not about I have to do these six things in 30 days. Um, so that's uh, kind of all, all I have today. Um, and we'll answer any questions. Um, and then again, if you, you have to make this, uh, here's a couple, uh, do you have to make the supervisor use a personal man? Yes, that, uh, um, we've had, a, um, all of us do that. Everybody at our company has done that. Um, so people know how to work with us too. But I would make my, definitely make my supervisor do it um, for sure. Is the personal user manual template something you can share? Yeah, I, we can share the questions that we ask. Um, but we, we try to, so with the user manual, we try to leave it up to the person because we don't want to dictate questions that they might not be comfortable answering. Um, so it is really about them and who they see themselves as, and all the content comes from them. There's a couple prompts if they need them, and I can share those with you if you email me, um, and you can uh, fill that out. And yes, this is a record. Oh, my, you got that one. Any other questions? Anyone want to come off? Mute and talk to the big group. For you extroverts out there. Okay. Well, um, thanks everyone for my time or for your time today. Uh, if you do have questions, um, you know, definitely reach out to me. My email is here. Uh, give me a call if you want to talk through any of this stuff more in, in, in detail. Uh, but again, I'm real. I think the biggest two takeaways to this are. People over production of big things. How do we focus on people? And then, you know, how do we continuously improve our process? No matter if we think it's the best, how do we cons consistently innovate? No, again, no one would use the same iPhone from 10 years ago because things change, people change, circumstances change. And especially now the workplace has changed. Um, yeah, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, my information is there. But other than that, thank you. Uh, for your time today, and we, um, I look forward to hearing from some of you. Thank you. And I'll stick around after if you want to have a virtual line, I guess, <laughs> like a speaker where they have lines. But that's weird. Uh, never mind. That was a dumb comment. Um, do you recommend different approaches, ideas of very small teams? So small teams is just as, a, I mean, you'll probably, because it's a small team of five to six, you'll probably have a lot more trust. Um, you should have a lot more trust. Um, I, again, I don't think the matching is necessary, a team that's small, because you should be working uh, so close anyways, and you should be have a, a, a vision around what everybody's doing. Um, but a lot of these things we do, you know, we don't match our employees. We don't have that large of a team. Uh, because we all know each other really well, but we focus on a lot of the programmatic and intellectual stuff and the infrastructure stuff is very important to our culture to have a process. And so on the small teams, I, we do pretty much everything besides the matching.
The question about the user manual. Yeah, so, okay, you got that one. Wyatt, you're quick, man. You're, I can't even catch up to these things. I try. Thank you. I try to be on it. There you go. Uh, okay, cool. Any other questions, you know, let me know. Uh, shoot me an email, otherwise, thank you for your time.